Well, it's 4.30 and I do think I will call this session to order. It's a pleasure to welcome Professor Martin Morgan of the Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center, State University of New York at Buffalo, to BIOC 2022. Martin uh, has led the bioconductor uh, project for quite some time and stepped down from leading the core uh, just a couple of years ago. And at that time, uh, Wolfgang Huber made a nice slide uh, detailing how the project had changed under his leadership. And there were a great many uh, changes, such as a uh, vast increase in the number of packages, number of users, quantity of data being shipped out, size of the bill to Amazon Web Services, um, and uh, really important changes to governance and community uh, engagement. So um, you heard also from, from Hervé Page today uh, when he received his Bioconductor Award for 2022, uh, just uh, how effective uh, a leader Martin has been. And so um, uh, I welcome you and I thank you and uh, take it away, Martin. He's going to speak about the Human Cell Atlas and the many interesting uh, functions he has written to help us explore that uh, resource. All right, great. Thanks, Vince. It's of course strange talking to uh, people over over the ether, ether waves, knowing that uh, some of you are actually uh, present in the same room. So I'm gonna share my screen and um, very confusing here, Google Chrome, okay, here we go. So I hope that, uh, I hope that you can see my screen. Is that, uh, that looking good for people? Maybe a thumbs up or something. We can see it. Great, perfect, thanks, Mark. Right, uh, yeah, so um, great. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, accessing human cell atlas data uh, locally and on the Anvil cloud. And I'm going to uh, use this amazing orchestra technology as well as package down. So I hope that you'll follow along the, uh, um, the package that I'm using is uh, documented here. And, um, and I'm going to use orchestra um, here, I'm going to find, for some reason, it shows up for me um, pretty much at the top with a ton of launches already, but accessing human cell atlas data, you could search for like human or something like that, uh, accessing human cell atlas data locally on the Anvil cloud. And uh, I hope you'll click on that and follow along and get yourself an RStudio session that uh, opens in the uh, package uh, Directory, totally amazing technology. That's a, so so impressed with that. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, the human cell atlas and CellX gene, two different sources of single cell data, and uh, the boots on the ground work have been done by uh, Ma, Kayla, and Ubo, and I just get to claim uh, the the glory here. Um, I'm going to follow these vignettes, and I'm going to start with this uh, first vignette, the A, HCA.RMD. And again, I hope you're following along. Uh, I'll go slowly. I was listening to the uh, Tidy Transcriptomics presentation, and uh, the presenter was totally awesome. He did a way better job of presenting than I've ever done. So um, I hope that you'll follow along, and uh, we'll spend about uh, 20 minutes on this vignette and maybe uh, 15 minutes on the B vignette and a few more minutes on the C vignette. Um, I wanted to start with thinking about bioconductor and single cell. And I'll just go to the bioconductor.org uh, website and visit the um, 2140 software packages and type in a single cell and find out that actually there are um, 213 packages that have been tagged as, uh, as single cell. And I'm sure you know this, but if you uh, drill down on any one of these packages, you get information about how frequently it's been downloaded, the amount of uh, times it's been 
asked about uh, support on the support site. And of course, these amazing vignettes, which can totally blow, blow you away with the richness of these resources. So the first point is uh, there's a ton of resources, uh, individual packages that um, allow us to work with single cell data. And then an amazing uh, secondary resource for single cell data is this book uh, called OSCA Books. OSCA, Orchestrating Single Cell Analysis with a Bioconductor. Several authors. Um, I was just going to jump down to the workflows, and there are 14 uh, different workflows that walk through particular analyses. This, this last one um, grabs some human cell atlas, human bone marrow data, and uh, imports it with a few lines of code and then walks through a typical um, analysis um, with a rich vignette and um, amazing um, uh, integrated graphics and so on. Um, so the point, the second point then is that, uh, that the OSCA is an amazing resource for learning about single cell analysis. So what I wanted to do though was um, actually um, explore uh, some of the single cell resources that come from the human cell atlas. And I wanted to start, uh, I'm a big fan of the tidyverse type of approach to things. And so I wanted to start just with a quick refresher and load up this uh, dplyr package and uh, start with a familiar example that empty cars uh, Motor Trend Cars, the data set, um, which has, uh, has, I don't know, some number of uh, rows and cars and of different sorts. And I just wanted to represent it as a tibble and uh, then display it uh, here as a tibble, uh, just to kind of see what we've got. We've got cars and miles per gallon and so on. And, and then this uh, pipe, the native pipe takes uh, uh, from uh, base R, takes uh, whatever's on the left-hand side and use it as an argument on the right-hand side. So this says, show us only the six cylinder cars and only um, select the car miles per gallon displacement and horsepower uh, columns, and then update things a little bit uh, with uh, um, um, uh, some metric unit liters per hundred kilometers. And you can see just how expressive this uh, kind of tidy framework is. So I'm, uh, totally enthusiastic about that, and that's going to kind of form the basis of how uh, we're going to um, access human cell atlas data. Um, so uh, what about the human cell atlas? So I wanted to go to the data portal, humancellatlas.org. Uh, I could just uh, human cell atlas uh, portal gets us there. And uh, this is um, the Human Cell Atlas is uh, sponsored by the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative, a uh, number of um, individual projects that uh, collect cell level resolution uh, expression data. Um, there are currently 267 projects, and you can see that you can uh, navigate these and find a particular um, uh, experiment and uh, learn about it, and um, then download um, uh, matrices, the uh, processed um, expression values that you could then use in your own analysis. So like that's the website, but perversely enough, I'm, I'm not so interested in the website because this is um, this sort of graphical thing, this sort of kind of navigating through and uh, clicking on things is really um, error prone. And, um, you know, I actually clicked on some arbitrary thing. I, I don't even know uh, for two minutes ago which one I, I uh, clicked on. And um, there might be many reasons why I'd want to be, do something that was more reproducible and rigorous, maybe even, you know, systematically search for studies that um, investigated, say, um, the brain or something like that. So I've written a package with uh, Maya um, called um, HCA. So I'm going through this AHCA uh, data set uh, vignette. So I'm going to load HCA and another package this guy, Daniel Van Klusk and I uh, worked on together as well as single cell experiment. So I'm just gonna load those guys into my R session. I think I didn't load them all. I just loaded the one there. I've loaded them, loaded them all into my R session. And um, instead of going to the website and exploring things that way, I'm going to enter uh, this command projects 
and that'll do the comparable thing. It'll visit the website or the API, the application programming interface that underlies the website, and it'll page through the projects, collect all of the information and report the data back to my R session. And so now I have, um, in my R session, I have a, a tibble with um, 267 projects and 14 different columns worth of worth of information that I could then process using standard um, standard uh, deep flyer types of techniques. So these are the these are the projects that we saw on the website just presented in a different way. You'll notice that um, many of these columns are list columns. And uh, for instance, this genus species, you can see that some of these projects have just a single genus, Homo sapiens, I guess. But this particular project actually has two species, mouse and man, and uh, mouse and human. And so um, the entire uh, representation is, a, is a, a list column where each of the elements of the list are, in fact, character vectors of zero, one, or more um, elements. And uh, that can be a little bit uh, tricky to work with. It can help to pull out individual columns or to use this uh, tidy uh, function called glimpse, which um, uh, provides you with a little overview of what the, um, uh, what the table looks like, or pulling out a single column, the head of a single column, and uh, pulling, pulling that column and seeing that uh, the first row was of this specimen organ part uh, was cortex for the first experiment, and uh, the second experiment had two specimen organ parts, and the third experiment and fourth experiment had zero um, um, specimen organ parts. So we're uh, discovering how to navigate uh, these uh, data resources. There's also a neat function called HCA view, which um, when you uh, invoke it, um, produces a little um, tibble that you can uh, navigate through here and uh, search, for instance, for all of the studies that involve brain, for instance, and uh, choose these studies. And, uh, and then when you're done, my is now the tibble that contains the two studies that you selected. So very easy to navigate through uh, and uh, interact um, with um, uh, these um, uh, large data sets. <clears throat> uh, let's see. <clears throat> so um, when we were on the website, we saw that there were like, you know, you can kind of count the number of columns are like 10 or 12 columns here. But actually, these experiments are incredibly rich. And they're represented uh, as JSON lists. And uh, you can actually request not just the 10 or 15 columns that are displayed in the project table on uh, the website, but all of the data. So, um, so um, you end up with uh, the 267 hits, and uh, each of the hits contains a certain number of uh, elements, and each of those uh, elements contains these uh, subsets that uh, expand into uh, different components. Um, describing, uh, <laughs> you can see how fun it is, right, to navigate these things, uh, describing in very rich detail the um, experiment. Um, I did want to mention, uh, so, so it's just useful to know um, that uh, um, there's a really rich uh, uh, data out there. Um, and yeah, uh, instead of um, sort of pulling down all of the data and uh, navigating it through it, um, as we've done here, or there's this amazing package called List Viewer, I think, List Viewer, uh, JSON Edit, List View, uh, JSON Edit. I'm, I'm going off script, so I've uh, lost track of, uh, uh, of the command, but uh, something like that, um, that um, List Viewer, I'm pretty sure. That allows us to, uh, okay. Uh, allows us to navigate um, these uh, lists um, comprehensively. But instead of sort of retrieving all of the data, it often uh, makes sense to query uh, the projects for things that you're uh, interested in in particular. For instance, uh, maybe you have a, an interest in, uh, in uh, liver and uh, 
you'd like to find all of the projects that study liver, maybe you're going to start a meta-analysis or something along those lines. So you can specify a filter that says uh, specimor, specimen organ um, is liver, and it could be a more complicated um, filter. And then when you query projects with the liver filter, you don't end up with um, 267 projects, you end up with 23 projects where the liver has been mentioned as one of the specimen organs. So it's a very useful way of finding um, data that you're uh, particularly interested in. So um, when you look through um, the HCA package, you'll see uh, projects, bundles, uh, samples, and files are the main um, entry points. And uh, the um, queries um, generally return a finite number of resources, and frequently you want to um, page through uh, the result set. So you get a thousand files, and then you want to see the next thousand files, and so on. And you can use HCA Next or HCA Prev to page through um, these larger data sets. Um, so that's uh, where I'm at so far. Uh, I can see, uh, I don't see anyone's faces or anything like that. I don't see a chat box, but if you're, if you do have a question, feel free to let me know. Um, what I'm going to do is, um, one of the great things actually about the HCA, the Human Cell Atlas uh, data portal, and unfortunately they're, they're not going to continue on with this, so it was a once great thing was that they applied a standard analysis protocol. So contributors would give uh, FASTQ files and then the HCA developed a standard analysis workflow so that all of the FASTQ files were processed in a standardized way to a, to a count matrix. And then the count matrix is made available as a, as a loom file, um, which, um, fit, uh, which can be easily incorporated into uh, Bioconductor and say at the start of one of those workflows that we saw in the OSCA book. So that was totally amazing. They've stopped doing that apparently, but there are about 77 files uh, that are currently available. So here I say, um, uh, and this is a little example of a little bit more complicated filter. I'm saying, hey, I'm interested in all of the um, standard loom files that have been uh, processed using the standard pipeline and that have um, integrated the samples within a single experiment. So I'll uh, evaluate this and uh, query for those files, and I find that there are um, uh, that there are uh, 79 um, of these standard processed loom files, which represents a wonderful starting point for, you know, um, tutorials or uh, student training or for comparative studies. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, look for the loom files that um, are also of a uh, liver. So I'm going to take my liver projects and I'm going to do an inner join with the loom files using the um, uh, project ID and uh, project title um, uh, to, to do that uh, formatting. And then uh, it turns out that there are um, 11 um, projects uh, that studied liver and that had these cells uh, samples processed in a standardized, a standardized way. Some of the projects had, um, maybe there were, um, uh, maybe there were multiple um, uh, samples, uh, different types of samples that were um, involved in this uh, particular project. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab one of these projects, uh, this one here, and I'm going to grab its loom file, and I'm going to. Um, Take a look at this. So let's see. So uh, this is the this is the cell I'm just going to focus on. The second, the human liver, cellular landscape by blah blah blah. Homo sapiens, caudate lobe of the liver, 10x three prime v2 single cell data um, processed in the standard processing way. Adult human cells um, and a loom file, and this is when it was was uh, generated. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, identify that particular file. And then I'm going to, um, this file, as you can see here, I'm going to uh, actually retrieve uh, the data from uh, the HCA. 
I guess this is going pretty quickly, which is great, right? Because everything's in the cloud, orchestra's in the cloud, uh, HCA is in the cloud. So we've um, downloaded this uh, uh, this um, Loom file um, containing uh, the um, uh, single cell data from that particular experiment. And we've saved it uh, locally on disk in a cache. So if we were to evaluate this command again, it would be uh, cheap. We don't have to re-download the file. And what I'd like to do is uh, take that file. It's great that it's on disk, but we'd like to be able to import it into, into Bioconductor. So I'll use the Loom experiment um, package, and I'll import the Loom file from the location that I saved it on disk. So this is... Uh, in real time. And now I've got um, a single cell, a loom experiment, which is like a single cell experiment, uh, 58,000 uh, genes, which is uh, sort of the genes that are used in their the HCA standard processing pipeline, and 332,000 cells. So actually quite a bit of data here. Um, you actually get quite a bit of useful information from the metadata on the loom. You get uh, information about um, uh, when um, the file was created, the the um, the um, inputs, the samples that were used, um, and the um, uh, pipeline uh, version, and and so on. So tons of uh, useful um, data. The thing about this Loom file, which is a little bit disappointing, but um, turns out to be uh, uh, can easily remedied. It has tons of information on the individual cells, this call data, these 43 um, columns. But these uh, 43 columns are all like uh, QC metrics, um, like reads unmapped and spliced reads and so on, and nothing about the biology. So we don't know if there were males or females in this study, what their ages were, anything like that. But it turns out that that information is uh, buried in the HCA, and you can retrieve uh, that information with this um, Optimus Loom annotation function. It takes the Loom file and figures out from the metadata where the samples came from and collects the information about the um, samples, like the biologically interesting information, and then um, adds that. So now we've got 98 columns instead of, instead of uh, 43. 98 columns that include uh, biologically interesting um, columns. Uh, um, so 55 new columns. So for instance, we can um, take the column data of the annotated loom and figure out that there are um, actually, in these 330,000 cells, there are um, actually five separate samples. Uh, four of them are male and one is female. They range in age from 21 to 65 years of age. And then this is the number of cells in each of the samples. So it uh, shows that there's actually a very rich set of data that's available in the HCA, and it's extremely accessible from within Bioconductor. So there are all kinds of interesting things that uh, one can do um, to um, uh, uh, get going uh, as a pedagogical tool and uh, fitting directly into the, um, the orchestrating single cell analysis um, book that we um, saw at the very beginning. Um, so I'm going to switch gears, but maybe I'll just pause and take any questions or uh, anyone have any thoughts. Is this thing on? Oh, there it takes a second, doesn't it? Anybody here have any questions for Martin? Yeah. Um, why was there a need for Loom experiments? Sorry, this is Leonardo. Um, hi, Martin. Um, um, from what I see, like you end up uh, casting it into single cell experiments. So um, I don't, I don't understand why. W w what's different in Loom experiment? Yeah. yeah. So the Loom format supports, in particular, this uh, row and column graphs. So. Um, Sort of hierarchical structuring of the rows and columns, um, and that's part of the Loom format, which didn't fit in uh, well with the single cell experiment um, class. So it's a that's kind of a lightweight extension. Mm -hmm. But that's the main reason. 
I'll, I'll mention that these assays are delayed. The, the loom format is an HDF5 um, file format, so it's an on the disk format. And when I loaded this uh, loaded this file, uh, it loaded really quickly because actually it didn't load at all. Uh, most of the data is still still on on disk, um, and so this object is actually quite lightweight, which also makes it easy to convert to a single cell experiment. Um, thank thank you, Martin. So, but this particular object that you loaded had no um, row and call graphs, right? It was zero. Yeah. Is that yes, the so, case for all of the human cell atlas? I think so, yes. I think that none of the human cell atlas data actually, they, they produce loom files, but the loom files don't contain the distinctive characteristic of row and column graphs. All right, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Pretty interesting. All right, maybe I'll switch to CellX gene. So CellX gene is totally just wrong. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so the so the loom experiment class is basically a single cell experiment subclass with a few extra fields added in. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I I kind of think that when uh, if, if we if we were to drill down and go a little bit um, off piste, we'd find that uh, I think that we can actually import when we imported this um, file. As a loom file, I bet we could import it as a single cell experiment directly, um, which is, you know, it advertises itself as loom, but loom is a is a is a single cell experiment plus, so we can just uh, import the relevant parts. All right, let me talk about the cell X gene. I, this is really um, cell X gene is really a Pretty neat little um, endeavor. Also sponsored by the, the CZI, and uh, in many ways it's uh, similar to the Human Cell Atlas. There are a number of different uh, experiments. Uh, collections are like individual experiments, and data sets are uh, data sets within an experiment. Um, so maybe one lab does an experiment that has several data sets, and so there's a collection that has several uh, data sets. And then you can uh, find the the study that you're interested in, um, Alzheimer's disease uh, from Seattle, appropriately enough, uh, and uh, find out a little bit of information about it. And then when you uh, click on this, it actually um, uh, it does something that I wasn't quite expecting. Oh, I didn't want to click on it. I'll I'll go back here and. Uh, I'll, um, I'll, so we drilled down on a bunch of additional information. I wanted to click on this um, explore um, icon here. And um, what it does is it, uh, the, um, when the investigator submitted the data set, they also provided
data sets to 21. So now I know that there are 21 data sets in CELEX gene that uh, contain African-American females who were studied with this particular protocol, which I actually find it interesting in and of itself. It uh, provides us with a quantitative way of assessing um, about uh, diversity and the uh, inclusion types of metrics within um, within the project in a in a contemporary project. So I'm going to grab the African American female uh, data sets, and uh, I'm going to um, find the files that are associated with that the, uh, with those uh, studies. And again, these are uh, files. So there are 63 files associated with these 21 studies, and these are files provided by the project. You'll notice that the 63 divided by 21 is equal to 3, right? And there are three types of files, H580, this AND data format, RDS, which sounds totally promising but is a bit of a boondoggle. Those are Surat objects. And in general, RDS files are terrible for um, um, uh, maintaining just because of uh, versioning types of issues. And CXG is the uh, internal CELEX uh, CELEX gene um, data format. So I'm going to grab this file, and uh, instead of um, visualizing it through the browser, I'm going to invoke the browser from R and visualize that particular data set um, from, from R. So I, I evaluated this set of commands and uh, chose that file and sent it um, to, to the browser, and here's my, here's my window. Where'd my window go? Here, here's, here's that data set here, uh, colored by uh, cell type. But it'd be way cooler to download that file to um, the local, my local disk, and then do all kinds of fun things independent of CellX Gene. So again, I'm downloading uh, this file uh, from CellX Gene to wherever Orchestra is running pretty quick because it's running in the cloud. And now I'm going to read it in. This is using a uh, Zell converter. I'm going to read the H5 AD file from disk into R and then uh, have a quick peek at it. And you can see um, that it's a single cell experiment. We've got uh, 33,000 genes and uh, 31,000 um, cells. And then we can just integrate that into a standard workflow. So trivially, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, create a ggplot that is the same as what we generated online. Um, but of course, we've done it interactively. And so now we have complete control over uh, this object, and it fits directly into the standard um, uh, bioconductor workflows. So CellX gene, the CellX gene package turns out to be a wonderful way of uh, reproducibly retrieving the data and then introducing it into into a, a workflow that we might be interested in um, doing. All right, I'm going to stop there for a, another second or so. Happy to take any questions. Questions. Thanks, Martin. Um, Leonardo, Leonardo again. So I'm going to ask you some questions that I get for recount. So two of them are, um, um, my impression of looking at the object is you can actually combine uh, the data across different um, Loom objects or SE objects. Uh, I saw that the call data, you're using character columns instead of factor columns. So am I correct in guessing that you can combine all of them together into a single very large object? Uh, yes, in, in principle, you could, yeah. Hmm. Um, I mean, uh, there's sort of like issues of uh, batch correction and so on, but yeah. That in no, no, but like just the, the C yeah. line parts of it before you analyze it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. absolutely. And then the second one is if I have my own data set, can I uh, process it in a comparable way uh, to compare against um, the HEA, or is that not easy to do? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, the, the next part of my talk. So, uh, and uh, it's it's great. Nice setup. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, shall I go there? Please. Okay. Yeah, so uh, Leonardo asked a great uh, question and I'll just go back to the, the HCA data portal. And uh, you'll notice that there's this, um, so we were under this explore tab where we had all of the data sets, but then there are these pipelines and um, the HCA came up with some standard analysis uh, workflows. For instance, this Optimus um, workflow um, for 10X uh, V2 and V3 gene expression assays. And um, uh, they formalized these workflows. So this, this is the sort of like the heavy lifting, right, of um, going from fast Q files to a count matrix. I mean, that's it. And part of the heavy lifting anyway. Anyway, that's a, that is a heavy lift, um, big data to moderate data. Um, and they standardized that transformation, the steps from, uh, from, op, from the FASTQ files to um, the expression assays. And they've actually done a great, I, you know, all things considered, a great job um, documenting um, what they've done. And the um, process has been written as a, a series of formal workflows um, in uh, WDL, workflow uh, description language. And you can kind of parse through here, you can see that it takes a bunch of, a uh, couple of FASTQ files, it's gonna use the star uh, aligner, it's gonna do a, uh, use a particular reference, it's got a, you know, a version on the pipeline, so that's uh, really great. And uh, this is a formal description of the steps that are involved including uh, parallel computation to transform the FASTQ files to a count matrix. So Leonardo, you could take your data, uh, your FASTQ files from your own experiment and apply this um, pipeline, if it's you know, the, the appropriate uh, 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 data format, and uh, come up with um, you know, an equivalent starting point for your study as for any of the other studies. And I think that's totally amazing. That's really great. Um, re reproducible. And of course, um, you know, you and I can disagree or uh, have conversations about the relative merits of different um, steps in the workflow. Maybe we dis disagree with one choice of parameters or they should have done something else, but at least we know what we're talking about. And um, that's uh, super useful um, and super exciting. And then um, the other so workflow description language, Optimus, um, standard uh, analysis pipeline, that's totally great. And then the only thing is that you actually need to compute resources to run the workflow, right? So it's all, all well and good to have a workflow, but if you can't run it, then, uh, then that's uh, unfortunate. And I just wanted to mention um, the Anvil project, uh, which um, we've been involved with, um, which provides us with that type of resource. So I've actually opened an uh, Anvil, anvil.terra.io, anvilproject.org. It's in the it's in the in the uh, the the third uh, uh, vignette, um, and I've opened a particular. Um, it's called a workspace, and uh, the workspace um, is uh, cloned from uh, something produced by the HCA uh, that um, illustrates how to use that pipeline that we were just looking at to analyze data. So you have. Uh, data, uh, 10 samples with FASTQ files, mice and humans, so they're sort of like two subsets of data. And then the idea is that you choose the workflow that you're interested in and uh, provide inputs, including um, references, cloud-based references to the FASTQ files. So the these FASTQ files are actually in the Google Cloud, they're not uh, local, um, and therefore access to them is fast uh, in the Google Cloud. And then when you're ready, you click the Run Analysis button, and it will uh, launch, uh, marshal uh, the compute resources required to run the workflow, run the workflow, and uh, produce um, outputs that are available uh, within the workspace, including, for instance, the Loom file. And then you could um, incorporate the Loom file into an interactive analysis using RStudio. Um, so that's really just a very quick tour of um, Anvil and the connection between the HCA and these um, 
well documented, well defined um, workflows and uh, the compute resources that are provided by Anvil um, to allow you to do the types of analyses where, you know, like, like Leonardo said uh, with recount, like you really like to do the same analysis on a whole bunch of different data. And this provides you with a formal way of doing that. Um, so I think actually I'll stop there. I think I'm at the end of my 45 minutes of, uh, of fame, but I'm happy to take any, any questions or uh, delve into uh, more detail on any, anything I've been talking about. Any questions? Is it on? Takes a little time. Hi. Um, you mentioned something about uh, a discontinuation of this process. Can you say anything more about that? Yeah. So there's a Slack channel. The Human Cell Atlas has a Slack channel where they announce new data sets that are added and. And I, I just noticed uh, the other day, last week, that uh, they were adding new data sets, but no more Loom files. And so I, uh, I asked about that, and they, uh, I guess they decided not to perform the standard analyses anymore, um, partly because of, uh, uh, I guess, the, pu the, the, the public explanation was that uh, uh, sort of uh, lack of consensus about what the right analysis was um, uh, for a particular workflow. Um, so, pretty interesting. Personally, I think it'd be great to do the wrong, the wrong analysis consistently, you know, right? tell the same lie. Um, yeah, that this. seems like it would be a little bit more useful to the world than not doing anything. Yeah. yeah. Or for each of us doing our own thing and telling our own lies. This is one of those situations where even, even doing the wrong thing might be better than doing nothing. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> at least learn something. Yeah. I guess it opens the door for some uh, for a project uh, for one of us to take up. <laughs> I guess. Well, one other uh, thing that came up a little while ago uh, with your metadata was the list viewer, and uh, somehow I think that package was not installed. And I know your list of lists uh, structures. Uh, also have this reflection in James path. Is that something that you think more people should understand and take advantage of? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of, I kind of, it's too bad that was it, is it list? It's list is viewer. It, I think you just, you just need to install it. I see manager install yeah. list viewer. Yeah. So uh, list viewer is totally um, amazing. Um, a way of navigating these complicated lists, list, list structures. Um, what did I have here? I think I called it PL. List viewer. JSON edit, which seems like an unlikely name for a function, but um, it, it provides, so this was this uh, list of lists of lists of lists of lists that I um, uh, downloaded. It's taking just a second to open up, uh, but here's, here's the viewer. And you can, see, uh, you can see that it's really straightforward to, you know, these are the 267 different projects and uh, each of the projects has um, uh, a title. Um, and you can sort of imagine navigating down uh, through that. But there's also a language so the, this little widget is great. Um, it allows you to explore these things um, in a way that's way better than uh, alternatives. But there's also a language for making these queries. It's called James Path, J-M-E-S Path, which is probably like totally familiar to, um, to the Java Easters out there. But you can say, um, hey, I want, um, 
for all of the objects, I want to find the hits that um, correspond to, uh, that have a project, um, projects. Um, let's see, what have we got here? Uh, I have to, let's see. Uh, so again, I'm going off, off piece. So wait, a, let's see, uh, let's start this again here. So here's our hits, transform hits. Uh, so all of these hits, we want to find project, Uh, titles, projects, there's projects, and each project, there are a bunch of projects, and each project has a project uh, title, and those are the, the sort of queries into the, look, kind of like uh, XML, XPath, you query into the, the JSON object, so this is the title of the first project and of the second project and so on, so this is called uh, James Path, uh, James Path. And uh, actually, in the Celex Gene DB package, there's a very useful function. It should be exposed more um, more broadly, um, uh, called uh, James Path, which will allow you to query a list object or um, a, 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 so, so these are JSON um, objects. The JSON object uh, query it for things like project title. Um, so providing a very convenient way of extracting data from these complicated structures. Thanks for uh, that uh, quick tutorial. That's uh, something we're running into a lot more often, the JSON uh, metadata. So it's good to have. Yeah. Yeah, I think you introduced me, Vince, to uh, this list viewer, that's a really great uh, little tool. All right, I've, I've overspent, over, overstayed my welcome, so I'll uh, uh, sign off then. I just have, um, Leo again, sorry. Um, yeah. uh, like looking at the metadata of your, um, any of your objects, um, I see that there's a lot of information there, but um, um, and I saw the Optimus um, documentation lists like what version of gen code was used, for example, what version of the genome reference was used. Um, I know that I saw that that information is missing from the metadata, um, so maybe that's a, uh, an area that could uh, for improvement there, uh, based on what Mike Love has worked on, right? Like that sometimes finding the annotation of of a file is really complicated. Yeah. Um, um, but the other thing is like, I see that my guess is that every single study is only available in one version of Optimus um, uh, or, is, or are there duplicated studies? And I mean, he just mentioned that maybe they're duplicating some of this, but uh, with the new version of the genome, are you going to have to redo all of this with like a new version of it? Because uh, that's going to change all the coordinates and all of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, you're right that uh, that these were run. There's only one loom file at most. One loom file. One. One. Uh, actually, the loom files are generated on individual samples, and then the samples are aggregated into a, a loom file that represents the collection of samples within a within a data set. Um, so, but there's only one Loom file per data set, and there's a particular version of the Optimus pipeline that was used to generate uh, that, and um, and that uh, also implies a particular reference genome. Um, I'm not sure that the reference genome is actually mm, referenced um, here. Um, it could be uh, could be um, that we've lost some of that in in the provenance of the object. Well, Martin, thank you for sharing with us. This was great. My pleasure. I always learn something when you when you teach. So still, still going on years and years later. <laughs> That's good. I'm, I'm glad I haven't uh, graduated to the negative learning camp of teaching. <laughs>
So I think this is the last session of the day. So I'm going to wrap it up. And um, I want to remind everybody that tomorrow we're starting up here rather than in the building here. So be sure not to go over there tomorrow coming here. Um, and thanks again, Martin. That was terrific. Thank you. Round of applause. Give you some digital applause too. <laughs>